continued. Only God can deal with sin, either as a disease or a crime, as an offense to himself, or as something that hinders humankind's approach. God deals with it by bringing it to trial in his own court of divine law, and not in an arbitrary or summary way. As a judge sitting on the bench, he settles the case with an outcome favorable to the repentant sinner. The settlement is neither uncertain nor difficult, it will be granted at once to each applicant, and even the worst guilty person with his case, will retire from that court with their burden removed, and an assurance that they can never again be summoned to answer for the guilt of their sinful character and deeds. Sin is too great an evil for humankind. In attempting to remove it, people find it only increases more and attempts to approach God in spite of it only make the condition worse. Similarly, rightness with God is too high for humankind to reach, too high for any but God himself to bring such a disposition to us. This, in the person of Christ, God has done, the guilt we have contracted is met by the rightness that God has provided and the separation that sin has produced is more than recovered by the new rightness which Christ places at our disposal. It is then clear, the gospel message answers, yes, in a most positive and wonderful way these fundamental questions. Can a sinner approach and be fit company with sinless God? Can a sinner remain in the divine company, and find favor? Can a sinner fitly worship a holy God, with safety to their person, and in honor with God? The divine answer satisfies our own troubled consciences as well as the holy law of God. It is final and effective. No other answer is to be provided, and no other affirmative answers exist. The issue has gone through God's court. No other settlement would be more easy, more pleasant, more secure. In contrast to this most pleasant divine arrangement, runs the tendency of most modern thought and criticism to refuse these terms of settlement and to withdraw them from the case which God has introduced into his divine court. Extra adjustments are attempted, humankind can refuse to admit guilt, or refuse to recognize the authority of the jurisdiction of the court. With such refusals, the history of thousands of years of evil has been minimized or ignored, the flood of evil that has darkened humankind from one single first sin has been denied or forgotten. Death, darkness, sorrow, sickness, tears, weariness, madness, confusion, bloodshed, furious hatred between people is all overlooked or misread. Humankind in this manner often repels the thought that sin is even a crime, worthy of divine hatred with an unbounded hate, and which God must justly judge. With sin so minimized as a trifle, a surface thing, by such modern considerations, those who propose them minimize the significance of the long sad story of human history. Those who would offer a naive view of the human heart as a seat of goodness fail to find support in the history of Earth's thousands of graveyards, millions of broken hearts and weary beaten souls, experiences in hospitals, carnage on battlefields, bloody sword and death dealing artillery further evidence is shown by the terrible effects of natural disasters, calamities and tragedies, the human experience of aches, pains, empty hearts and broken spirits. Each of these evidences are an indication not only the impersonal consequences of natural law, but instead the breaking of divine law, and evidence that sin and its consequences face a right and divine justice. The soul who sins will die. Those with modern criticisms that refuse to recognize the guilt of sin make light of the law and ascribe injustice to God, or reject his existence. In our present age such thoughts are ever present. But it is the refusal to see sin as God sees it, and as the law declares it, even against the backdrop of human history that most clearly reflects the departure of godly faith. For those who admit the evil of their sin, a divine remedy is available. For those who deny it, only the right and just penalty of the law is applicable to their case. For it is by law is sin known. Both in condemning and in pardoning, God's intercession on the part of humankind must uphold, and not come at the expense of, law. 
favor to the guilty party must also be by lawful means of pardon. In this way law is venerated and upheld in high and noble scope. By God's divine remedy, in which both law and love are elevated, to such a degree that in a specific sense love becomes a fulfillment of law. For the law that was against the sinner comes through God's remedy to be upon the sinner's side. It takes the sinner's part in the great controversy between them and God. For the sinner will put their case into the hands of the divine advocate, will find the advocate alone knows how to conduct it properly, and bring it to a successful conclusion. The advocate is the Lord Jesus Christ.